Welcome everybody to Breaking the Chains of Planetary Magic. So, first question for you, my friend, is why are we doing this? Why are we putting this out there into the world? One, it was requested by multiple people on the channel. And number two, the heart of why we do this is the whole idea of self-empowerment. I'd like to give people the chance to be able to see the chains by which they're bound so that they can free themselves and that they're able to look at their choices despite the magnetic pull and be able to make a more wise, educated choice, having that understanding. Okay, I think that's as good a reason as any. Like, you know, don't be pushed around by this. Like, be reclaim your agency, reclaim your power. And I hope that the spirit of that is captured by you, dear listener and audience member. And uh, with that, shall we get started? Let's go. Okay, when we're talking about planetary magic, the uh, the first basic principle of this is where these planets are exalted. Is that kind of the theme of where we're headed with this? Yes, and why these are so important is, is they are like magnets. They are gravity that move us. Yeah, and so when that's moving on you, you can feel, you can either flow with it or you can see it as an offer being made to you and something that you can either accept or decline and hopefully with that uh, you'll you'll be able to make conscious choices and not be held captive by something so uh, let's start the first one is the sun in aries and we've got that represented by our friend thor here with his uh is the stormbreaker axe yeah something like that so first thing to understand about sun and aries is um when the sun does hit aries or the constellation aries where it passes the spring equinox it's where the days the daylight goes to equilibrium and it overcomes the light overcomes the darkness it gains its power and aries is a representation of the first house it's the self and the sun is power it's god Therefore, it's an exaltation. It's exalting the power of the self. It's an exalting the I am. That's the theme of it. Okay, and so if we're talking about sun and Aries, what does that look like in a person if someone has that in their birth chart? Um, I think you might know something. <laughs> yeah, I am sun and Aries. Um, it's It exalts the, the identity. Like, it it's, can be the type that will exalt yourself like hey i'm good at this and you're also can say oh i'm not as good at this but like if you're good at something you could say it but also it's the, the archetype to uplift others to be able to bring up the good in others like hey you do that really good like to bring an exalt ego is a magnetic like force so a magnetic way to pull people and for example people don't the, the opposite of a, an exaltation is called a fall. And that's why Libra does the opposite. The sun's setting. It's going into darkness where there's more darkness than light. It's been weighed and balanced in the scales of Libra. And sometimes people find it appalling because sometimes Libra per personalities can... They're chopping the ego down with people. Yeah. Sometimes. They want things to be more fair and equal. Or what. Yes. Oh, you're getting too big of an ego. Let's cut you down. So it's the whole idea of flattery. Like you mm -hmm. can be... Like if somebody uses that archetype, that exaltation on somebody and they want to get something out of them, they want to manipulate them, they could puff up their ego. Oh, you're so great. You're so... So that exaltation can be used uh -huh. even in how you talk to somebody. And, and, and it's one thing to be conscious of. Like people could use that on you to get something out of you. And like, like a predator male could like start flattering the woman that they're with that they're trying to get more out of and same thing with the woman to the male if like sometimes it's different what they're looking for between men and women but like they can flatter a person to get stuff from them it's like that concept to realize that like and and we bring this up and we bring this to your conscious mind because we're not saying that hey don't take flattery don't take a compliment we want you to be conscious of it. Some people may use that 
to get something from you. If they can flatter you, they can make you feel like super warm about them. And if it's not genuine, they could be using it to manipulate, to get things from you. Mm. And same thing with like a pastor at a church. They could be like, oh, you guys are so great. We're the chosen yeah. one. And we have the greatest church. I, I'm making Pastor Trump. <laughs> <laughs> the most, the biggest, most beautiful church. <laughs> so the idea if you can flatter people to be like, you're God's chosen and one and only, or you're the only one that can do this. You're the only hero that can save the day because it's ultimately the archetype of the hero. That's why I have Thor up there, the empowered individual, the, the, the individual that's filled with power. Um, if you can make people feel that, you could, they can get things from you. They can get more tithing. They can get more um, support, more adoration back mm. by using this archetype. Yeah, and, you're so great. Give me some money. Like, yeah. I mean, that, that's kind of Hollywood plays with that all the time, too. Like, what, like showing you stories of this in exchange for you parting with your hard earned dollars. It was once said that the planets like their stories told. And then they, mm -hmm. and there's people that will talk to them, talk about them like they are living entities. And they imbue vast power to those who tell their story. So mm -hmm. think of this in terms of movies. And we're going to pick on. On Jana here for a second, and um, can you give us any movies where they've imbued these archetypes or themes to put a magnetic attraction to the story? Mm -hmm. um, any of the superhero movies, Batman, Spider-Man, it's just a normal person going along and then they have something happen to them and then all of a sudden they've got this superpower and they're empowered all of a sudden. Yeah, it's like we get different skins on these stories. And and we're telling just a planetary alignment story and we dress it up to look like Spider-Man or Superman and we're just rinse and repeat. And sometimes they struggle with controlling their abilities or they lose it for a little bit and then they're regaining it back and we just get pulled into these stories. Yeah, and so many of these, you know, we'll and we'll mention one of these explicitly later on in our in our session, but so many of these are almost literally shot for shot, note for note, beat for beat, the same darn movie that we've seen a million times. And we'll, we'll, that's a teaser for later in this presentation, but. Uh, it's more than superheroes. I'm thinking of like other movies where there's like a nobody and, and then they. Um, chick flicks do this all the time too. The female oh, version of it, like, yeah, you know, it's the the Hallmark Christmas movie trope where the uh, the girlfriend or the the lady has this boyfriend she doesn't like so much. Maybe this is more of a Libra story, but you know, it, Libra. it's the uh, it's the opposite of it, the the opposition of Aries. But that's why I thought of hero... Cinderella as that kind of a story because she's kind of a nobody. She's able to you know, save the day. I, you could argue that there's three exaltations in the Cinderella story. That's a, the point I wanted to get at next is the movies that do really, really, really well will imbue the movies with more than one planetary exaltation. In fact, one way that... that this won't be the last time you see an Avenger on the screen. Right. <laughs> and one thing to point out is, is who this episode would probably benefit more than about anybody is somebody that's a writer or a creator. Mm -hmm. If they're writing stories, especially fictional, and if they understand the planetary magic themes and they can abuse like at least three of them into one of their stories, they, they could make a very magnetic story that would do good. Because it's like all the big movies have them, if not mm -hmm. more of them. Especially the cult followings. Your Star Wars, your Lord of the Rings. Harry Potter. They'll, Harry mm -hmm. Potter, they will use more than one of these. Mm -hmm. And that is why they'll just like, pull the masses big time is because they know what they're doing they're purposely putting these in or they're very intuitive and they just naturally know it works intuitively <laughs> I, I guess that happens sometimes but i would say most people probably have some there's a lot of uh, astrologers that are employed in hollywood mm. like that's that's a famous and well-known yeah so anyway so, Sun and Aries, just to reiterate, uh, that's, that's the ego, that's the, the main character, 
and that's the I am the self that's that's flattery is the way that's often used against you so when someone's saying hey you're so great you're doing such a good job hey you know maybe uh, maybe you guys could like try this out in the comments section down below <laughs> <laughs> There are a few other themes with this. I mean, the hero that and, saves the day. Yeah, but any form of self empowerment, the idea of like lifting weights and getting buff, the idea of getting skillful with anything, being able to be trained to have a skill. Um, you know, Viking stuff has got popular in pop culture lately. Mm -hmm. If you listen to Viking music and they're singing about Valhalla, the energy about is self empowerment, feeling masculine and strong, and like you can do Empowered things. And um, like the, you've heard the song, this is my fight song. Yes. That's, that's a sun and airy song. And even in, in music, yes. if they imbue these concepts in, they can pull you in like a magnet. Yeah. So it, it's essentially any form of self empowerment. Yeah. Like where you rise, where you rise to the occasion. Who doesn't want to rise above all their challenges? Because ultimately when you look at the path of the sun, and, and how it goes into the plane of light where there's more light in the spring and summer than there is darkness. And then you dip into the darkness. It is the Aries constellation and the sun where the sun hits Aries where it overcomes the darkness. Who doesn't want to overcome the darkness and vanquish the darkness? Yeah. And who doesn't want to see a movie of somebody overcoming the darkness? It's very disappointing when you walk away from a film and they like fail <laughs> or they lost the treasure or whatever. It's like, oh, that kind of sucked. Looking at you, <laughs> Avengers Infinity War. <laughs> <laughs> I actually love those. <laughs> but if you go into it knowing it's part one of two, but like, if you, yeah. if you go into that thinking that that's... That's All the of the end. movie you're going to see is like, that is the worst ending of spoiler, but, by the but, way, of a five-year-old movie. But they end those usually with a different exaltation, huh. which we'll get into. Mm -hmm. That's true. We'll Teaser get into that. Coming. Teaser for here in a few minutes. All right. So moving on, our next exaltation is the moon in Taurus. So let's talk about the moon. The moon is the ruler of Cancer. Cancer is the mother of the zodiac and it has to do with femininity. And so the moon is very feminine in nature. And it's more right brain, it's more intuitive. Mm -hmm. Taurus is abundance, it's possessions, it's the pot of gold. And it's the idea that like you can use your right brain, your creative brain, to get around something, to get to that. Interesting. So so think of having a creative way a feminine creative way a right brain way finding the treasure and it becomes yours mm, this, i like that a lot I, moon and taurus is one of the uh, <laughs> one of these that i have <laughs> so in pop culture any like where somebody's using their special abilities their special thinking to get the treasure it, it would also be the archetype of like earning it right yeah, well, it, it's more like national treasure. Mm. It's more like uh, uncharted. Mm. So like, not not quite. You know, well, I mean, Pirates maybe, of the Caribbean. Yeah, <laughs> like something where uh, yeah, you're you're going about it. Maybe you've got a magic tool. You know, the in pirates. You have the magic compass or something that exactly. takes you to where the treasure is, and then you take it, and it's yours, and then. You know, another one that comes to mind for me is The Count of Monte Cristo. It's a mm. favorite movie of mine. Mm -hmm. and now it's starting to become clear why. <laughs> <laughs> Relatable. It, and, and the other thing is um, it's the same archetype that can get people caught up into like gambling and stuff or like lottery numbers or um, mm. certain people will be like, oh, if I could just, if I pick my lucky numbers and I do it and they come up with some special reason why they have a chance more than somebody else, it can be a magnetic draw to why they're going to win the lottery, like inside their head. And it's also the draw even to money, the emotional draw to money, because the moon can be emotions too. Oh, and it's yeah. just, and it's just the natural emotional draw to abundance. Who doesn't want to be a king and have it all? Yeah, and it's that moon, that moon connection. You know, a ruler of Cancer. It's security, it's safety, it's home. Who doesn't feel a little more secure with a little more money in the bank and a little more, you know, whatever it is around your house that uh, makes it feel a little more like home, right? True. 
if you look at this in the idea of like chains, we're chained in this way, a magnetic change to kind of lust after resources. Yeah, I mean, I get up and go to work every day. I think you do too. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there's a gravity here. And it's a gravity that to, even if we haven't fully figured out how to get around this, um, it's a gravity that's in our face pulling us each day to have more and more and more and more. Yeah. And so how do you... Uh... How do you recognize it when it's happening to you, and how do you how do you break it? Um, it it's not always that easy to break it. Like, um, like I think my my first answer to that, though, directly is to become. I think having some form of spirituality in your life and finding fulfillment in all the aspects of your life lessens this a little bit. But um, on some level, it is healthy to be grounded to providing for your family or your loved ones, you know, like, and there is some need here too, you know, so. And, and you know, one area, you know, since, since this theme is heavily about money and stuff and material possessions and things, um, I'll, I'll kind of give you the, the lesson I teach my kids about money, which I picked up from, I believe it was Dave Ramsey, if you've listened to him. So full credit to Dave Ramsey. I'm sure he will love being credited on this kind of chat. <laughs> but basically, like it, it's keeping in balance the three things that you can do with money. Um, there are, And there are only three things that you can do with money. You can spend it, you can save it, and you can give it away. It's the only three things you can do with money. And in a well-ordered life, I would put forward the proposition to you that, generally speaking, in a well-ordered life, you should be doing some of all three of those things. Now, yeah, of course, you'll go through seasons where, hey, you're getting ready for, you're anticipating a major expense. Maybe you're having a child, or maybe you're getting ready to go to school. And so, in the anticipation of that, you'll be a little bit out of balance, with these and you'll be saving more and hoarding more money and then when you're in the middle of it you'll be spending more money um but you know if you're 89 years old and you don't want to you know, you've got a giant pile of money that you don't want to give away and you don't want to spend what's it for like so the the out of balance version of this is ebenezer scrooge Yes. You have a whole bunch of money and you don't use it for anything. And what Ebenezer Scrooge learns in that story is uh, how to find that balance, how to both spend it and give it away, because that's where his life was disordered and he had to be visited by three ghosts in, in you know the Christmas carol that we're all familiar with. But it's restoring that to balance in your life. So you know how, how you relate to resources, I think, is a big theme here. And... If you're doing well, like some of the, I mean, I'm going to say a couple of things that sound contradictory, but some of the greediest people I know don't make a lot of money and they hold on to it very tightly. And some of the most generous and giving people I know are absolutely loaded. They have piles and piles of money and they, they, they don't have the attachment to it. So it's not, it's not about having money or not having money. It's about your relationship to you know, how, how this, this principle interacts with your life, if that makes sense. And giving back, like helping out somebody less fortunate is, is a way of lessening that magnitude too. Mm -hmm. It's a way of being more healthy with it. Yeah. Creating balance in all of it. Yeah, and, and keeping, like I say, all of those things in balance. And this is something I teach to my kids when they earn $5 for doing a bunch of chores in the house or the yard or something. Like, okay, you've got $5. Let's make a plan to spend some of it, save some of it, and give some of it away. Okay, so our next one, right? Jupiter in Cancer. Jupiter in Cancer is our next planetary exaltation to talk about. Okay, this is where I want to fight back. You were talking, you guys were crapping on movies that end badly, where the good guys don't win, they don't overcome the darkness. But when they do, it's with the Jupiter in Cancer theme usually. It's the idea that you save the chosen one or the one that can potentially bring expansion and then save the day and you bring them to safety because cancer is the mother 
the home, the safety, you keeping them safe, you're saving them for, or you're saving them for another day. day. It's the idea of preserving the One Ring with Frodo. It's the the idea that Aragorn and Lord of the Rings went away in exile. It's the idea that um, um, Luke Skywalker didn't get killed by Darth Vader, and that they he was rescued and put into safety, and where he can go train and expand and grow. It's the Moses story with um, being put away in a raft by his by his sister and like saved for a la another day to where he can be preserved and fight back when he's gained power. But this, this is a theme that is also used in movies quite a bit. And it's used when you don't make the other one, you have to put this one in. Mm, so this is when you do preserve the good guy, you, you conquer the darkness, and everybody gets to go home and live happily ever after, right? Yeah. A way of, like, perhaps breaking the chains of it and where it gives us a magnitude how many of us like go and work a regular job and we're, we're the man's putting us to it taxes beat us down more but we, we have this steady income that is just safe we're doing what's safe we're, we have our insurances we, we get our minimal wage but it's consistent, it's steady it's reliable it's this energy that can draw us into that to not going out and being an entrepreneur and making a lot more money or or may prevent us from getting into cells where it's not not as consistent there's a lot more potential out in the other parts of the world to make big money but it's also this magnitude this gravity that pulls us into doing things that are simply safe even if it's not the most prosperous for us it's one of those traps for us yeah, and so uh, you know, because it has, we're, we're kind of relating to the uh, the, the prior one too, because there is a resource and security kind of theme here uh -huh. that's in play. So it has kind of a resource related theme here. Um, you know, one one of the great ironies is that people get sucked into taking the stable nine to five job, mm -hmm. right? Where. That all depends. Though those even those so-called stable jobs depend on someone somewhere taking a risk for how big this operation can be. Whether and it doesn't matter what field it's in; it can be any field. And if that risk goes badly, the business goes under, and you lose the stable nine-to-five job anyway. But if you can find a way to put yourself out there, put yourself in the position of, hey, I I can maybe accept some variability in life. You know, that that can benefit you substantially. I feel like I'm almost doing a rip off of the Dave Ramsey show now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because I have Moon and Thomas. I don't have Jupiter. <laughs> well, and Jupiter and Cancer, that's like nurturing, taking care. So a business owner, you could think of that as Jupiter and Cancer, right? Like he's got all of these employees, he's paying them, he's nurturing them, helping take care of them, their livelihood. Mm -hmm. Does that does that fit? Yeah, leader of a team kind of thing. Yeah, he's expanding and nurturing, and there's like there's a magnetic pull for people wanting to be the boss, wanting to nurture their team and be the caretaker. So some people can be drawn to it that way, but most of the time people get caught in the gap of the other way that we've kind of explained it. But they more want to be nurtured, than, yeah, than mm -hmm. do the nurturing. If they use it that way, they're becoming more conscious of it, though and using it to their magnetic advantage. So when you... Ex Clarify. So exaltations are... Mo a lot of them are based on a position of a planet where there's like a forward m movement. There's like a momentum going that way. Not necessarily Jupiter and Cancer, but they're, they're usually based on that principle. For example, um, the sun is going to find its peak of power in Cancer. And so when you put the sun at Aries it has the forward movement to move there. It's taking it back a step. And like, mm -hmm. it's like getting a slingshot and pulling it back. You're pulling it back to where it really is supposed to, it, it's natural place is forward, but pulling it back gives it some momentum, some thrust. So it's that math, it's those mathematics that these exaltations, a lot of them are based on. Mm -hmm. So they have those energies that want to, where, where they're wound it's like the energy of being wound back and flying forward. Um, so they have those magnetic poles. There's something thrusting it. And therefore, um, if you can use them and you can use the momentum your own way, 
even in principle, even if you don't believe in this stuff, the, the principle of it, applying it can give you power. Like, so give us like a real life example. Of- so what you give energy to, like if you, like if we're even on this podcast and we give a lot of energy, a lot of nurture to it, a lot of like caretaking to it, and we're giving up ep- regular episodes and regular quality episodes, it's going to grow faster and faster and faster. And we hung out with some good friends today and that were, uh, that are other podcasters that, that, that have had us on their program. And, um, she's at 15,000 views right now. I mean, 15,000 subscribers and she's been doing it two years and, um, she puts like regular content on it, regular nourishment to it. Yeah, and you know exactly when to expect it. Yeah. And it comes at the same time, every time. So the idea that you would give care, love, nurture, it grows Hi, things. Attention. And it's like this, 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 planetary exaltation can also be used in your power it's and then go to go back to your question an example of it it would be cancer's unconditional love and to expand unconditional love would be to like give a whole bunch of unconditional love to a spouse you would nurture and grow that relationship when you are constantly giving them nourishment love appreciation not it's the it's the opposite of capricorn capricorn's criticism Capricorn's the whiny goat, the goat like squilling out like, I don't like this. You know what I mean? Um, it, we'll talk about the Capricorn next time. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, um, so anytime you apply like powerful nurture to something, it grows. So you can use these principles to enrich your life and you can do it in an unevil way. Like, but it's just a natural theme. Like, what you nurture grows. Okay. So how would you break the chains on that one? If someone's trying to, uh, you know, in a lot of uh, em- employment, a lot of businesses will refer to how do we get either our customers drinking the Kool-Aid so they don't want to consider someone else. Mm-hmm. Or how do we keep our employees with the golden handcuffs? Or maybe you're an employee who feels like you've got golden handcuffs on. Like... And so how, how you would break the chains is first you would recognize that, hey, maybe this is happening to me and it feels okay right now. I'm, I'm not telling you to walk away from your great job or run away from a business that's doing good work for you. I'm not telling you to do that, but I'm saying like, be aware of this and really step back and see this as an offer that you can either accept or decline and then say, you know, if, if short term, like this happens all the time to, to younger people who are just starting out, they get a job that's making more money than they can imagine, but it stops them from going to school. Mm-hmm. And so they get those golden handcuffs on and they stay in this rut and they don't end up going anywhere. And it, it feels good in the short term. They're making a lot of money because they don't even have a degree or whatever. Yeah. But they don't go anywhere later. And like like somebody fresh out of high school say they're making 50,000 a year right that's a lot of money that's a lot of money for a single out of just out of high school kid but like you go to school mostly of like video games and (laughs) Cheetos it's gonna buy us video games and Cheetos great but the risk the time that it would take school to him to go to school where he could get a hundred and forty hundred and fifty thousand dollar job like or learning to start his own business where he can Take home five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year. So yeah, so we're not pitching this at you guys like, hey, this is good or bad, or we're making a, a choice in your life. We want you to be empowered and acknowledge that hey, there's a magnetic pull. It's keeping you at your job, you're feeling safe. We want you just to be aware of that there's a magnetic energy there and be and, conscious of it. Yeah, and then when you're conscious of it, then you get to decide. Exactly. Is this in my interest to continue or do I need to make a change? And that's, you know, that's what we're trying to do. It's all about agency. Ultimately, the way to break the chains is to take a risk, though. Yeah. Go I, start that business. Start that side project. Yeah, it could be a side project. You could dip your, like, you could consciously say, hey, I'm going to dip my, f- I'm going to keep one foot in. I'm going to do a good job at work, but I'm going to have a little side thing I'm doing. And and well, I'm going to give that some nourishment and I'm going to make start another job as my hobby. And I'm going to take a risk on this on my spare time. Yeah. It's a sacrifice. You'd have to give up some of your fun time. 
probably give up the video games, but I'm yeah. an advocate of that anyway. Well, I'll be honest with you. I, we, we put time into the channel. We're not video gamers. I don't think any yeah. of us ever... Well, and we'll talk more about games. video games later on, too. <laughs> yeah. That's another... I, I feel like we keep teasing. We're halfway, you know, we're halfway, half an hour into this, and we're still, like, uh, we're still teasing stuff to come, but we've got a lot of good material. So, the next planetary exaltation is the Mercury and Virgo theme. We've got that represented here with a scroll and a seal on it. Yeah, that's the official seal. That's what has the absolute authority. So, okay, so Mercury is communication, right? It's the ruler of communication. And um, Virgo is the virgin. It's pure. It's in order. It's perfected. It's organized. And it takes a control system to make a virgin. Like, people don't just massively become virgins at large like and stay virgins till they meet their first lover and get happily married ever after right yeah, that takes a value system to make that happen yeah so and um when you consider that there's a magnetic pull for communication to have be done by authority to be done by the correct person the correct credentials the correct chain of custody to come from the government to come from like if you're religious it the priest the pastor whatever whatever pastor or religious figure prophet pope whatever who leads your faith that person becomes virgo and mercury and virgo for you he becomes the authority and when you hear from other people it doesn't matter there's like there's a map we we're not telling you not to believe your religious leader but we're telling you there's a magnetism towards when you've signed up you've drank the kool-aid there's a magnetism that's holding you as that person as your authority or the bible even for some for a christian person the bible has became mercury and virgo it becomes the the seal the stamp and to a atheist a scientist no they they see it as something completely bunk, but it shifts depending on your perspective. And this shows up in plenty of areas of life. You know, it, it broad strokes, you can say the person who knows what the heck they're talking about, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, if I, uh, let, let's just say that I was on a video and I was saying, I'm going to tell you the secrets of health and fitness. And you see that I weigh Let's just imagine 300 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> you should question that because that's the inverse of Mercury and Virgo. That's like, right. um, I call BS on that because, you know, if you know the secrets, you're not living by them. So I'm going to go get my secrets. But if, if, on the other hand, that I'm, that I only weigh 250 pounds, but I'm absolutely shredded, like in real life, <laughs> you know, then maybe I'm worth listening to, right? So it's, it's the, someone who knows what they're talking about and it's the legitimate authority uh, on whatever the subject matter is right and once again we want you to be conscious of the gravity of this and realize that if this power can be usurped you you can get your how you see things disseminated in a, in a controlled way for example um, all it would take is usurping the power over the colleges and you could control like how scho what scholars allow to be verified mm -hmm. or not. And I, and I noticed that there is like, and I'm just going to say this, we have a scholar that is part of our team and part of our channel. And I was just talking to him about the subject the other day and he basically said, I made it a point to not let them brainwash me with their, with their dogma. I I told myself like going through college, I'm not letting them, like, brainwash me and let me just repeat all the things the other scholars, um, repeat. And what I've noticed is is where a lot of scholars go a lot more like left brained in how they think, and and I have friends that are very scholarly and 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 even when we've taken criticism from a couple people of the scholarly nature on the channel it they they have this like line of authority it's a mercury and virgo that they've traced like i got i was on we were on another program 
getting an interview and somebody got really mad at me for calling, uh, bringing in the idea of the God of war with Aries and, 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 uh, Mars and connecting that across the, the board map of the, in the meaning of that sign. They're like, that is Greek. That is Roman. That's, you can't trace that to like Babylon or where, wherever else. Like they don't believe it. It's not true unless you can prove that there's a direct link. Mm. And despite like in, in the, when you go to the Hebrew people and you go to the, the Bible, you've heard the term probably Lord of hosts. That's how it is in the King James version. But I have a, a Hebrew friend that's been really influential to me. He's a Jesus believing um, Jew that came from a Jewish tradition, right? And he's been very influential with me. And he tells me, I, I think Lord of Hosts is very a bad translation. Um, and he speaks Hebrew. And he goes, Lord of Sabaoth, he, he calls it. And that is better translated the Lord of Armies. And if Jesus is calling himself the Lord of armies, which is like a, it's almost synonymous with, um, Ares. Ares, the God of war. And, you know, very fitting for the guy who says, I'm going to come dressed in red with my robes dyed in the blood of the wicked. <laughs> yep. So peace loving hippie Jesus right there. So I guess me and my, a little bit more, I have, I'm about balanced with my right and my left brain. My, my creative side and my logical side. I've even done engineering, so I have the left brain. Um, but my, my point is, is uh, when push comes to shove, like I see the world is eventually all coming from one source. And it's like the pieces of truth have been exploded all over the universe, all over the world. And I just keep, even if you can't trace it, I'll find cultures that carry same traditions even though you can't find the link they'll still have the same legend mm -hmm. like like a lot of the same deities across vi like viking culture roman culture greek culture they'll describe all the same lightning god deity with the same color hair and it's just like yeah. that's just not a coincidence like they they eventually link together you can look at their languages they still have some similarities when you go back to the same time frames and scholars will just like oh no you can't prove it it's not true and they get to where they're just trying to block information and, and keep it controlled but yet across all cultures you'll have the same symbol and i'm just like dude can't you guys see it so that's where i have a bone to pick is like people let this get in their way they let the official resource like control the narrative no matter what like even though if I, I don't even get fully get the logic on it fully there's places for it but i think we it, we should look at how truth is accepted and look at the idea that there are ways of controlling information and it, and it does happen and so kind of the, uh, the the ultimate downside of this one you know when you have a official truth um you know, the, the, the story that comes to mind to me is the Emperor's New Clothes. The official truth is that the Emperor's New Clothes are the most fabulous, the most tremendous, the most beautiful. It's a big, beautiful robe that he's wearing. And, you know, the, the way to break this chain is to trust your own intuition and to see what's right before you, to be like the child at the end of that story that says, the Emperor's not wearing any clothes. And so sometimes... The scholar, the, the, the head, the chief, the guy that is put on TV in a suit to tell you that, you know, something is very safe and effective and effectively safe and really wonderful and big and beautiful and whatever else. If your intuition is telling you, I don't know about that, the way to break that chain is to explore that and see if the real truth is different, perhaps, from the official truth. And keep in mind that, like certain people have different reactions to different things and some people can like eat sugar and some people can't some people have bad reactions to it and it's death for them like diabetics like if they don't have like some people just can't have it right and so keep in mind you should honor like the inner light inside of you I certainly honor things that are specific to you um and 
You know, I was raised on the uh, on the food pyramid. Growing up, I was taught the official truth of how you diet or how you eat balanced is carbs, 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 baby, all the time. And it turns out, like now, the official truth has changed. No one's yeah. really allowed to talk about that very much. And we're probably preaching to the choir because, like, the official narrative, like, there's a lot of scientists that will be like, "You can't prove astrology." There's no, and they'll just go to the point of like, because it's not their stamp. These right? people probably have Mercury and Virgo, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but even that idea, and, and this is something I've wanted to maybe even do an episode on. Let us know if you want us to do an episode on it. But I want to talk about the right. Rec- on an episode, the difference between the right and the left brain, the, the creative feminine part of the brain and the left masculine part of the brain. The left masculine part is like two plus two equals four and it always equals that. And then the right side of the brain is more abstract. It's more creative. It's more yeah, the right side's more like for what? For flowers, for water pots, for clouds. How big? You know, and it's like you're, you're all, all of a sudden, just by saying that, like four constellations, we're, we're thinking about something totally different than, yeah, 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 two plus two is four, great, whatever. But yeah, yeah, it's and Mer- beautiful. Yeah, and Mercury and Virgo's like there's like one truth and one truth only. This means this, right? It's like taking like a symbolism from scripture. Somebody that's fully only left brain will be like, this means this always and only. And yeah, it's right- building a chart and a graph with with beautiful lines and a nice clean outline that you can say, oh, okay. And it'd be a lot easier if scriptures were written this way. And if you're looking at using it and you want to use this exaltation for your advantage and you're doing a presentation, mm-hmm. break out all the graph, hit all the check marks, make sure you fill in all the blanks and put it in perfect order. And it gives you a great power in presentation. Yeah. Very persuasive for sales, for uh, landing that job. Um, persuading someone like hey we need to change the process at work to do it this way if you can if you can use the mercury and virgo theme you can usually make your point and win the argument yeah all right so our next our next planetary exaltation is saturn in libra we got two images here and I, I referred to this when we were talking earlier as we have Pocahontas and we have Pocahontas in space because they are exactly the same movie they are one was a lot more expensive to me we call it putting different skins and once again with movies they're using they're telling the planetary stories and they're sucking you all in over and over again just putting different skins on the on the planets so what, what does Saturn and Libra look like in a birth chart in a person it's like, oh, it's, it's an exaltation. So there's a magnetic pull there, but it's almost like a curse. <laughs> like, because Saturn is like seen as, a, you can see Saturn as a curse, but it's the, it's like really hard to suffer a Saturn in Libra or a Saturn in the seventh house archetyped and not get a divorce. Like it's really tough to hang on to a marriage if you have that, that alignment. Um, it could be the I it could manifest as like um having friction in the marriage. It could ha- manifest as a, a parent standing in the way and opposing the marriage, even though you guys are lovebirds like Romeo and Juliet. West Side Story. <laughs> West Side Story. Um so that's that's what it can look like in a birth chart. It can manifest just like the movies. Yeah. And so in a in a story. We chose Pocahontas here as our as our example of it. Describe that theme a little bit. You know, she's in love with the the wonderful new stranger, but no one approves, and it doesn't work out. In it's the a end. different enemy race. Yeah, it's retraction. It's an opposing force, and guess what? It all sucks us in. It's the the same idea and archetype, like. Uh, that even among friends, like, um, hey, did you hear this? So what happened with so and so? The gossip about like a relationship gone wrong. It's also that theme. Hey, it's I heard a, they got a divorce. <laughs> oh, I heard so and so cheated. Like I heard, like all those things are Saturn and Libra. Libra. It's why gossip is so magnetic. Oh, and it sucks us. In. It sucks everybody in. Ultimately, when something happens, um, 
where, where relationships gone wrong, there's relationship problems. It's, there's a magnetic pole drawing us in. How to break the chains of it. Um, you could have this happen in politics. You could have just the mere accusation of it that could destroy a reputation. And um, it comes back to the Mercury and Virgo thing. Like we should be looking at how we see truth. We like, cause all it takes is accusations. Even if the person says, Hey, I didn't do that. It's something that should probably be looked at a little closer instead of just always getting sucked in. And um, there is an energy of a little bit of like what goes around comes around. If you get sucked a lot, like way into gossip, it could be same thing to come back around to you. So it's just something to be conscious of and how you live. And so one of the ways to, to break it is if you're, if you're finding yourself embroiled in like business that's not yours, other people's drama, other people's relationships, um, maybe take a look at that and say, gosh, maybe I don't belong here. Maybe this is someone else's business, someone else's problem. And I ought to stay in my lane and focus on, you know, the inverse of Libra is the self. Focus on me, my life, my marriage, my family. Let's talk about the movement of the planets in this because Saturn's at Libra. And where does Saturn belong normally? Where does it rule? Capricorn and Aquarius. So Capricorn, yeah. Not super far away. So it, it, it rules at the, the coldest parts of the seasons, the darkest days. Capricorn's the darkest day of the year, right? Like the winter solstice. Mm. Um, so you wind it back, you pull it back. It's natural home is it the winter solstice. What you're doing is pulling it back out the clock backwards, like a slingshot, like once again, and it's like ugh, thrusting you to the underworld extra extra fast. And it and, and if you look at the theme, when somebody has relationship problems, Saturn and Libra, this magnetic attraction for everybody to talk about, where does it usually take you? It takes you to the dark dark night of the soul. It takes you to a death where the sun is buried and there's very little light. It's the tomb. Yeah, like how many true. people that have gone through all that and they had to go through a death because like of how bad their last, last, last relationship was and how it didn't work out and how it fell apart. Even the Romeo and Juliet story, didn't they end up killing themselves? Yes. Yeah. It's that it theme. Is. It's taking you to the underworld. Or the uh, the West Side Story iteration of that, where I think one of them gets killed by the gang, and the other one. It's been a while since I've seen that one. So, Have you guys seen How a Red Fern Grows or something like where that? Where the Red Fern Grows? Yeah. That's so a name I've not heard in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I was like so young when that. So one dog. So it was like the sixties. <laughs> no. We're not that old. Yeah, we're not that old. Um, but I, two dogs like loved each other, right? They were like companions and where one died, the other one got sad and died. Aww. Yeah, it just laid there and died. I think the one got rabies. Man, this is a downer of an exaltation. <laughs> it, it is, it's a magnetic force. It would really though. suck to have this in your birth chart. Yeah. <laughs> we're not gonna say any names. We can name off a lot of people in history and stuff that it's like, oh. <laughs> So anyways, it is something, it's one of the most powerful ones. Well, Saturn is often referred to as like the boss, the governing one, the father, the the one, you know, the, the one, the destroying angel. And so the, the exalted destroying angel, yeah, that, that can wreak some havoc on your life. And so breaking the chain of that and saying, how do I focus on improving my life, myself, my marriage, my relationships, my family. How do I do better at that and better at all of that and and stay out of other people's business? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, and, and where it can like probably poison us is we get to this point where like we have this magnetism on the opposite opposite side where which we've already talked about, which is the sun and Aries, and we can get caught up into like um, getting into the theme of like, I want to be me, I want to be self-powered, and and then we can get sucked into that, and we can have our relationships crum crumbled because mm -hmm. we don't compromise mm -hmm. at all, and we can see our partner is bringing us down, and it, that's a 
that's a magnet that can suck us down a vortex and fail in our relationships. So if you're looking at um, uh, overcoming that magnet, um, honoring your partner, your neighbor, as much as you would yourself, you know, like treating yeah. them with the same love and respect and kindness. And like leaning into, you know, maybe, maybe not necessarily breaking the chains in this instance, but, but honoring the, uh, the exaltation theme. Um, Libra, what, one of the themes of Libra is contracts, right? Keeping your word. So honoring it and not, rather than being cursed by this, you can be blessed by it by working for it. Honor your word, keep your commitments, make commitments. Like if you're, I'm not here to be anyone's judge or telling anybody they're going to hell or anything like that. But if you're living with your boyfriend or girlfriend of five years and you have a child, but you haven't bothered to get married, get that done, get married. Like, and, and honor that, like by making a, a contract, tell death to you part, tell, uh, you know, making this commitment and then keeping it and being faithful to it is another way to not be harmed by by this this particular thing. Fair enough. Moving on, we're we're back to one of my favorites because it's about me. <laughs> Mars in Capricorn. This is we, we told you there was more Avengers coming, so here's here's the other one. Mars in Capricorn. Can we like take a sidetrack and talk about like? The real symbolism of Thanos. Yeah. Sure, you can talk about whatever you want. It's your podcast. This is our show. <laughs> okay, just one side detour. Um, like, it's kind of like, do we see a mockery of Jesus? An archetype of Jesus? The idea that Jesus is coming I've with got a judgment? Friend, I've got a friend who refers to it as an inversion of Jesus. Yes. Inversion is a good way to say it. Yes. Um, I, I like inversion. But he, they, it's like they took the Jesus theme of judgment coming at the end of the world and killing the wicked and leaving the righteous. And then they. You know, there's they, those Bible verses that say one shall be taken and the other left. And the Thanos character kind of presents that rather literally like 50 50. 50 50. Half of everybody is gone. Yeah. So. And, and just as another sidetrack at the end of that movie. Spoiler if you've not seen a five year old movie. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you notice that Thanos, in the very end of that movie, is standing on the water? Oh my god. What? So, yeah, when he's in the uh, in the soul realm. Sorry, I'm kind of a nerd, folks. He's, uh, <laughs> he's in the soul realm. He's looking at the little girl, Gamora, that he had to sacrifice for. There's another Jesus y theme. Whoa. He is standing, he is walking on water. Wow. They really did do... I believe they did it on purpose. They were making Jesus the bad guy. Yes. Yeah. They, they took all the Jesus stories. themes and then inverted it, turned it upside down, made it the bad guy, and pushed it out to all the world. And we all sucked it all up. And we all surrendered mm -hmm. countless dollars and <laughs> hours of time, and energy, and attention to say, wow, what an, and, and you know, waiting with bated breath for the next part to come. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> So, back on course. So, back to uh, Mars and Capricorn. Um, I think the, if I could put that in a word, I'd say fight the power. The yeah. powers that be, the governance. It's once again, where does Mars rule? Aries, right? Yeah. It's Mars. winding it, pulling it back <laughs> out, uh, out, back up the clock to the other four quarter and to where it has this forward thrust of. It's, it's the idea is it, Mars is being placed at the darkest, evilest part of the year, the winter solstice, where there's more darkness than there is in, on any other day. The winter solstice, and you're pulling it back, and you're trying to get that forward momentum to overcoming the darkness. So it's the idea of that great warrior, that Mars god of war archetype, that hero without fear that's debatable but it's taking it to the evil dark lord the father the governor the the mm -hmm. evil lord the one that has everybody under his thumb the undefeatable villain well and and you know this might be a bit 
a bit of a deep cut that Saturn is traditionally the ruler of Capricorn, and if Mars is bringing the fight to the Dark Lord. Um, Sauron or Saturn? Yeah, Sauron, Saturn, Satan, whatever name you want to give, but Saturn's not all bad, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that. It's it's ast- astrologically required of me. <laughs> <laughs> but the the other uh, the other way that the Mars and Capricorn archetype, the temptation that sucks people into is just beating the dead horse, like just consistently pounding something until it's, you know, I, I, I joke with someone that uh, it's like. I will tear down this building one brick at a time if I have to kind of energy. Yes. And I don't care if you're laying new bricks while I'm doing it. I will outlast you and I will keep going. It's a very defiant theme, right? Yeah, it is a fight the power kind of energy. And, you know, you can get sucked into, uh, like, a lot of people in political movements get sucked into this and maybe doing stupid things they shouldn't do because they just, they, they want to not be under the thumb of the government, whether, whether it's the right or the left. It doesn't matter which side you're on. This, this is not a political point. It happens to both because they both get manipulated by it into, you know, getting into getting embroiled in conflicts that maybe would be best left alone and walked away from. Yeah. Any, any, exa- any other examples of how this theme is used? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of a favorite movie of mine, V for Vendetta. That is uh, essentially Mars and Capricorn, the movie. Go and watch it immediately <laughs> if you haven't seen it. Pause this podcast. Go and watch V for Vendetta. <laughs> Leave us a comment about it below. <laughs> <laughs> Return and report. You'll thank me later, especially if you relate to this at all. Um, yeah, I would say that like half the movies out there, especially the m- movies directed towards males, have this theme in it. Like most all action movies have this theme. Yeah, Die Hard. You know that that's the guy who's just going to keep coming after the terror. Doesn't matter how much broken glass he walks over, or how many times he gets shot, or how many times he runs out of bullets. He's still going to win the fight somehow. Yeah, um, Lord of the Rings: Return of the King, where where they decide to. They just barely survive the battle, and then they turn and go to face Mordor, and it's a losing battle, and they're just hoping to buy time for Frodo to get lucky, right? And Luke Skywalker going to face down Darth Vader, the dark father figure, uh, and, and, and 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 Palpatine, like the, the the Emperor, like that wasn't a winning fight. He was supposed to lose. And the idea that, like, this lone warrior is going to face down the Empire. Yeah, what do you expect? me to walk out there with nothing but a laser sword? However the line goes in the new Star Wars movies that aren't very good. You know. Those got a lot of um, backlash, but they didn't... They weren't able to use the planetary exaltation. They didn't capture it right, yeah. The first trilogies were loaded with planetary exaltations. George Lucas... uh, I suspect knows something about some of this because he was involved in those first few, hasn't been involved in the later few, and it's almost like the people involved in the later ones were more interested in surprising you or violating your expectations when what they failed to recognize is there's a reason these formulas work and we all watch the same damn movie over and over and over and over again with new skins on it because we like it. Let's talk about the basis of that story. Um... The, the son in Ares, the empowered person that's gaining powers. Luke Skywalker getting trained. Luke Skywalker that getting hit away, Jupiter and Cancer, and pr- protected, preserved for another day. You have um, Saturn and Libra, where um, Anakin gets brought to the dark side because of his breaking of the rules. And, and he loses it. his wife in the yeah. end of that one. And then this, uh, and, and it even has like this a Saturn in Capricorn, a suffering archetype there at the bottom. But then also the idea of Mars in Capricorn, which is the exaltation, um, facing down against the Dark Lord and uh, overcoming the darkness. Like they used all the four, the four main, main ones that are all from the, yeah, the, the exaltations built on the cardinal points. It used 
all of those in the Star Wars movie. And the Star Wars universe is the one of the biggest genres out there, but they used all the exaltations. Yeah, Lucas sold it to Disney for like something like four billion dollars. So if you can come up with a story that uses all of them, you too could get four billion dollars from Mickey Mouse. <laughs> from Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Speaking of Mickey Mouse. There's one more. Yeah, there is one more. All right. This is, it's hard to believe, it's our last planetary exaltation for the night. And this is Venus in Pisces. The fairy tale, the dream come true. The fairy tale, love story, dream come true, the fantasy. Mm -hmm. What does this look like in a person? Um, I want to interrupt and like detour you for a little bit okay i like detours um venus and pisces so venus is romance right yeah and it's exalted in pisces which part of the body is pisces the feet huh venus is, is this also like known... foot stuff is this <laughs> yeah <laughs> I was gonna like say Cinder the cinderella story thing. i was like this isn't about foot fetish <laughs> we're just about to go down a really strange scorpion <laughs> okay but venus in its original hieroglyph was also known as a foot so it's matching the foot with the feet mm. the, the theme of the a, story is the feet and that's a big feature in cinderella for those of you who have not seen that movie in a while there's a glass slipper mm. and it's it's the chief means by which the prince identifies the girl he met one night that turns out to be the girl of his dreams that he wants to go and live happily ever after with. She left behind her glass slipper. Mm -hmm. Which goes on the feet. And they found that it fit the feet. So these are... This is a very cosmic story. Something to understand about Cinderella. We talk about this in our Ancient Cosmic Language book. Um, it's a very old story. It's known to come from the Greeks, and it's believed that the Greeks got it from the Egyptians, and the and and the Hebrews got their language from the Egyptians, and it, and the Bible uses some of the same symbolism that comes from this story. This story literally is explaining the exaltation. It is the core, the main story of this exaltation, told like in its perfect form. So, um, it's a very incredibly powerful story. Um, yeah. so it's like the baseline for it so all these other movies of the happily ever afters and their themes are kind of based on this main archetype yeah on Cinderella so how does it uh, how does it suck you in what's the pattern that people get trapped in happily ever after is the Pisces theme and it's escapism it's the fantasy world it's uh, the illusions um, it, there's a magnetism towards wanting to go to the plane of light because Pisces is the last constellation that the sun passes before it goes to the plane of light, the warm, the paradise, the Garden of Eden. We all want to go there. We all want to escape. We all want to come home from a hard day's work, and we want to relax. We want to we want to zone out and look at disappear in the television or in the YouTube or. So that's kind of the downside, like parts of it. Like it's we we want the imaginary happily ever after if we can't have the real one, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Another archetype that this is is like fantasy worlds. Like um, uh, you could get sucked into gambling on this. I know one of them. We use that as a different archetype, but gambling, like wanting to gain, because Venus is about like what you want to receive, mm -hmm. and so if you want to receive a fantasy. Like gambling's one of those. But it um, can also be wanting to receive like a beautiful romantic relationship. It can be. Yeah. Yeah. So it can be very, very good in romance. And that's why it's exalted in connecting with the heart. So if you're trying to connect with people's hearts, this is the theme. Mm -hmm. um, if you're trying to connect with people's minds, you use Mercury and Virgo. You present in that way. Very articulate. But this is connecting with love and passion and fantasies of the heart another pitfall like one that can chain you up is um like porn would be based on this exaltation like it's, yeah the fantasy girl is perfect in every way and super into you and you know she i, I probably shouldn't keep talking because <laughs> we get really dirty really fast but i don't want to get us an explicit rating but like this is a real magnetic pull to be aware of like 
trying to get sucked too much into this. This is the, where people get addicted to social media. They get addicted to video games. video games and watching movies and TV all the time and constantly having to get to zone out. It, there is a magnetism there. And, and, you know, especially the video games that are uh, substitutes for real life, you know. Back when I was a kid and I played video games because I'm 85,000 years old. <laughs> the video games I played had a beginning and a middle and an end. And you'd play for an hour and then it was over. Now the video games that are made are like a whole other world and they just keep on going. And it's like, what are you doing? Like, well, you're leveling up or something. And I, and I don't mean to talk dismissively of you because I, I don't have any experience with this. Like, the video games that I played when I was a kid have a screen that says, The End. Every one of them does. You know, Super Mario Brothers. That's how old I am, folks. <laughs> the End is a screen you get to. The... Now you don't get that in video games. It's it's a whole other world that it creates, and it's just continuous and more. And By the way, give us some more money. We came out with a new expansion pack on this thing. Aren't those like Elder Scrolls games really long? Like you go explore like a whole world and you just disappear. Ah, like Dragonborn? There's a cold? lot of games that just keep going and going and going. Or you keep building. Minecraft is one that... Yeah, you build no, more stuff. There's no beginning, middle, or end. Very popular, very fun. Um, That's a good point. But you're right. There's no beginning, middle, end. You can just get lost in it for forever. So And so, breaking the chains of that, recognize when you're getting sucked into something that's taking you away from reality whether that's video games gambling porn daydreaming whatever it is recognize when you need to come back to reality and and live in the real world for a while so Balance that you it can with the virgo energy. yeah with the with the virgo uh, mindset and energy so that you can you know ironically if you will do that that puts you in the position to go and find the man of your dreams, the girl of your dreams, and live happily ever after and actually experience this for real. Yes. Yeah. Another way that you could kind of, uh, I guess, get manipulated in, like, if, when it comes to, like, knowing what's true or not, um, this is a very arc, strong archetype of um, getting emotionally connected to some something. Mm. So if they can help you, like, feel a certain way they they and even and and you can get to where you can if you get into this archetype you can almost skip that checking if you feel so like wonderful about yeah you'll it. get caught up in the the emotion of the moment and think this this politician who's speaking is just you know he's so the savior kind, of the universe so he's so wonderful <laughs> such a sweet old man so, or young man or woman or whatever like or or it can be um i, I know an individual who uh who has this in her birth chart and one of the downside ways that this manifests for her is she struggles to tell when uh when her kids are being like actually experiencing emotion or when they're just manipulating her like when her kids cry, she can't tell the difference sometimes between a real cry and a fake cry. All of our kids do that. And I saw this and I talked with her and I realized like, oh, you actually like... And th this isn't a judgment against you, uh, dear individual who I hope is listening. Like, oh, you actually like... You're, you're wired not to be able to tell. And so the way that you do that is like... You, you know, your husband or your friend or uh, other people can tell. I can tell when my kids are faking it when it's real. Even my young, young kids, right? Mm hmm Yeah, so even like one other example is, is somebody could set up a presentation and show you a movie of like kids getting rescued from really bad situations and then instantly right after be asking for your money or for your donations. And it could be real, but it's the type of archetype of setup to make a pull on people's money that will, may make them not um, where they could e more easily like suck them into donating right away without fact checking, without researching around it. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the ways yeah. where this magnetism can suck you in. Tug on the heartstrings, think of the children. Let me show you a picture of a suffering child. Dig deep, pull out your wallet, and give me the money, please. Yes, we're not we're not telling you not to donate to them, 
But what I would recommend is to become conscious and realize, hey, they've done this to make a pull on me. And then you can be conscious about it and say, okay, well, let's let's look at it. Like, is it a reliable organization to, don't, to don't donate to? Do they show their books? Can they be trustworthy? There are ways of counterbalancing it and making a more conscious choice. Yeah, and, and how you want to go about that, you know, largely is going to be up to you, but my two cents worth on it is slow it down. Like, don't get your checkbook out while the tears are still wet in your eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, go home, work out the math with a pencil and paper longhand of what makes what they're claiming, what you need to do, how you feel like you should contribute to this. Evaluate who are these people? What are they doing? Are they real or is this phony? Sleep on it. Like, just put some time between it. And really, just that passage of time will bring you back to reality and will confront you with, yeah, this is a good decision. I'm going to move forward with it. Or, glad I didn't get sucked into that. Either way, yeah. you'll be happy with your I, result. I feel like if I if I have like a, a beggar in the way and they're asking for a few bucks, I'm quick to give it, right? But when it comes to like larger sums of money and big commitments, or big reoccurring. be big reoccurring things where somebody was pulling on you emotionally and and you're not even sure whether you could afford it or not. Yeah, like I we we I, we turned to each other, my wife and I, and we're like, oh, let's think on this a couple days and see how we feel. Let's let's give it some thought and we'll look at it. We'll research it a little more. And there's been a once or twice where like oh something would come out out and it would be as a known scam and or at least the public the vast majority of public opinion turned that way and they're like dude these guys are con artists and and then you're like oh yeah i avoided that definitely yeah. so this is what we mean by all of this like make your own choices we respect you but understanding the pulls of the planetary themes can make you much more wise and help you make like more balanced decisions ma more balanced decisions of course you know, you call it more balanced <laughs> yeah well and there's nothing wrong with getting into the the fantasy the imagination the romantic fairy tale make that your goal and it does have to be balanced with the reality of the virgo daily routine of things yeah it's still a part of life everything everything if you want it to flow in its best flow, it does have to be balanced. If, if you I don't, like yeah, if you don't honor one, you you will notice it in your life. There will be an imbalance in the exact opposite, one eighty degree aspect. I like it. Okay. Um, if you have any questions on planetary magic, or any questions on any of this, um, feel free to. Ask Leave questions your comments, the especially you know those of you who are haters. <laughs> we we love hate too. We love uh, love hate comments because they boost our algorithm and they, they fuel my power. <laughs> you you know what? One time uh, there was somebody getting really mean in the comments, and I said I said that to them. I said thank you for your comments and thanks for fueling our algorithm the guy like raged on me told me i was the most evil person in the world <laughs> you're just doing this for money <laughs> wait 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 we're, we're getting money from this we are hello <laughs> <laughs> all righty all right well you guys have a good one Peace. we appreciate you <laughs>